um, this is intentional because this is how private and anonymous I would like to be. <laughs> Um, but uh, let's see how it works for biometrics because more and more uh, people are getting concerned about how um, uh, adequate uh, is the protection on uh, biometrics and um, today we have a discussion about um, uh, law enforcement and uh, cooperation on uh, um, on this topic and together we are with us um, uh, we have uh, Sara uh, Monteleone, uh, she's going to be our uh, moderator. Sara is a policy analyst uh, of the Members Research Service, uh, EPRS, in the Citizens Policy Unit. Um, we have uh, Carolyn uh, Goemans dorni um, she took the role as uh, an Interpol uh, DPO. Um, on the technical side, we have uh, Kiran uh, Raja, uh, an associate professor at uh, the University College of uh, Southern Eastern Norway, um, and he's going to uh, discuss a little bit more about uh, the technology regarding uh, fingerprinting and um, um, speaker, in integration, uh, speaker identification integration. Um, and then uh, we have uh, Evgeny um, Moyakin. Uh, she's a, uh, he is a postdoctoral research fellow at the Security Technology and E-Privacy Research Group at the University of uh, Groningen. And uh, last but not least, we have uh, Catherine uh, Jasserin, uh, um, PhD researcher at the University of uh, Groningen. Um, working as well um, um, with the security technology and a privacy research group but she's focusing on the ingress um, uh, project um, and she will um, be able to to tell you more about uh, about the the research they are performing um, so as you notice we have uh, two different um, uh, research teams um, uh, willing to, to show their, their research and to tell us more about uh, um, uh, how uh, privacy protection for, for biometrics uh, work in, uh, in law enforcement. So, um, Sarah, okay. you have the floor. Okay. Uh, oh, and uh, one uh, housekeeping remark. Uh, we will open the questions uh, at the end of uh, the speaker's presentation, so please write them down, and uh, we'll get uh, back to that uh, at the end. Okay, thank you, Valentina, and uh, welcome also from my side. Uh, just to stress, of course, that uh, this uh, panel is uh, on biometric system, law enforcement, and border control, so the challenge to uh, data protection. I uh, would like to uh, stress the fact that uh, there is a panel, uh, in this panel, we will address uh, the issues in, uh, in uh, at least under three uh, main topics. Uh, one is will be on verification versus uh, identification. The other one is uh, on the law enforcement cooperation. And the third one is on uh, the data protection and privacy by uh, design by default. So first of all, the first topic, the verification versus uh, uh, identification. We know all that uh, there is uh, an increasing trend to grant law enforcement authorities with uh, access to personal uh, data, including biometric data, that had been initially collected for uh, uh, verification uh, uh, purposes and they are more and more <coughs> used also for identification purposes. So we will uh, try to address these issues both under the technical and the legal uh, perspective. So first of all, I would like to ask to our uh, technical expert, uh, Kiran, uh, basically what is the difference between, under the technical point of view, what is the difference between identification and verification? And uh, if you have some example uh, regarding the biometric data. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so uh, technically when we uh, go to the uh, when we talk about biometric technologies, two main things that we always deal is uh, one is the verification, the other one is the identification. Now what is verification? It's uh, typically, let's say, Homer Simpson. <laughs> he takes his uh, passport, goes to the authority, the border control, United States or uh, European authorities. He says that he is Homer Simpson, and the authority just takes the uh, picture and then does all the processing that is internally it could be face, it could be fingerprint, voice, or any other biometric data for that instance, and do the typical biometric processing. Extract some features, uh, do the comparison, and then say yes, he was uh, Homer Simpson or not. So this is very fundamental principles of uh, working of verification system. And now if you actually, uh, 
take the same example when it comes to identification. It's a rather a broad area where you would where you would want to see what exactly is happening. It's uh, the cameras think who is this person. When I mean cameras, it's the authorities that is sitting behind the cameras that are interested in knowing who it is. So in this case, uh, you try to identify a person, a person of interest. Uh, you see who is this person now, and you don't know who this person is because of which you have to match it against the large data set that you have with you. And this data set is typically collected for a verification purpose. Uh, for instance, when Homer Simpson got his uh, passport, his picture was collected, and his picture is up there in the uh, in the database. And I want to match this specific person from there and try to see who that person is. And now this is a, a very common scenario in the surveillance. And uh, in the result, it would actually say that this is Homer Simpson. And uh, just just to recap, the whole processing pipeline that was in the uh, previous case in the uh, verification remains the same except that uh, you don't know who the identity is, you would try to match it against the multiple. And now this is the same thing that hap happens for uh, face or fingerprint or any other example, for instance. Uh, especially when it comes to fingerprints, it is the Latin fingerprints that we talk about. When the criminals leave the fingerprint on the, on the uh, coffee glasses or on the water glasses or water bottles and so on, you get the fingerprints from there and then try to match it against all the databases that you have. Uh, for example, the EU Interpol databases or uh, the, uh, the border control databases across uh, USA and so on. So this is uh, the brief introduction to what uh, identification and what uh, verification is without going much into the details of uh, technicalities of uh, each of the technologies. Thank you, Kiran. And now, uh, under the legal perspective, uh, I would like to ask uh, Catherine, what is the definition of biometric data that we have uh, in the new data protection framework? Can you tell us a little bit more, please? So, um, in the new uh, GDPR, in the GDPR and the new directive, actually, uh, biometric data is defined, and uh, the definition covers both identification and verification uh, functions. So, the use of biometric data for these uh, two functions, but there is also an ambiguous wording. It's, it's very, uh, it's very interesting actually to read the GDPR Article Four, Paragraph Fourteen together with the recital 51 to see why it's ambiguous. Um, the Article 4, Paragraph 14 of GDPR is worded in the same way as the Article 3, Paragraph 13, it's not 14, and 13 of the directive. And biometric data are, first of all, personal data. And they result from a processing uh, that relates to biometric characteristics, which allow or confirm the unique identification. So actually, if you read the definition, it's not very clear what it what it means or what it covers. There is no reference uh, to verification or to uh, biometric identification as such. But in recital 51, uh, in contrast, um, photographs, so it's only about photographs, they are biometric data when they are processed to allow the unique identification or authentication of an individual. So you understand that these two functions are covers, but uh, the uh, ambiguity uh, between these two provision, the recital and, and the, the article, actually raise the question of what is unique identification, whether you should understand it from a data protection perspective, have a threshold of identification, or from a biometric perspective. And if I'm saying that, it's because it has an impact on the, on the, on the nature and uh, how biometric data are, are treated. The processing of biometric data, uh, when, when it's to uniquely identify an individual, is the processing of sensitive data. And under the GDPR, it's prohibited as a rule, unless an exception applies, whereas under the directive, it's allowed under our strict conditions. So this is a very important distinction. The two functions are covered, but uh, we don't have yet enough uh, interpretation to know exactly what it means and, and the scope of it. Thank you, Kelly. Very interesting. Uh, uh, now I would like to ask to Evgeny, because uh, we forgot to say at the beginning that uh, all these speakers are also involved in, in two uh, uh, big project, European uh, funded project. One is a, a SIP, Speaker Identification Integration Project. The other one is a Ingress, also on a, a fingerprint, on biometric and fingerprint. Uh, and uh, Evgeny, <laughs> I would like to ask you, according to your experience in, uh, in the SIP project, how can individual be identified by law enforcement agency? Can Thank you, you tell us? Uh, well, well, personal data uh, basically means any information relating to identify or identifiable natural person 
data subject, as they're often called. Biometric data, as explained by Sara, is a specific type of personal data, sensitive data, which must be protected to a high extent. Um, as you can imagine, due to its nature, biometric data can be effectively used to uniquely identify any individual. Uh, law enforcement agencies are specific entities which are interested in this use. So if uh, a known person's biometric data uh, is in the hands of law enforcement agencies, such as fingerprints, facial images, even voice data, they can try to identify those persons behind the data. I've noticed in the previous days of the conference that much focus has been placed on the GDPR. But we shouldn't forget, as it has been mentioned during one of the panels, that there are also other legal instruments which are of importance. For example, Convention 108 and also the new directive which complements the GDPR. And in this regard, the operations of law enforcement agencies are governed by the new directive, which is going to be transposed and the member states are already in the process of transposing its uh, provisions into the national legal rules and procedures by the 6th of May 2018. So they still have a few months to go. And basically the directive applies to the field of criminal justice. It is used for law enforcement purposes and these purposes are quite diverse. For example, uh, investigation, detection, prosecution of criminal offenses, but also uh, the actual uh, execution of criminal penalties, which also includes safeguarding against threats against national security. As you can imagine, it's quite a broad concept of the purposes identified in the directive. And in this respect, data controllers and data processors play a very important role. Data controllers, uh, in contrast to the GDPR, are in this regard competent authorities or law enforcement agencies. In the GDPR, we have natural and legal persons, in the most cases, so companies, businesses, which process personal data. While in both cases, processors can be natural legal persons, public authorities, and other bodies. I would like to make a link uh, with regard to the project that I've been participating in, the SIP project, or SIIP, which stands for Speaker Identification Integrated Project. In this project, uh, funded by the European Commission, we are trying to create a system together with end users, including law enforcement agencies for the Euro from the European Union and Interpol, which is capable of identifying speakers, unknown speakers, in social media, but also in lawfully intercepted uh, voice data, intercepted by law enforcement agencies. And the idea is to make sure that the system operates in accordance with all existing data protection and privacy standards. And that's what we take care of as legal experts. Thank you. Thank you, Evgeny. So now we uh, pass to the second uh, main topic of this panel, the law enforcement cooperation. Uh, we know that uh, nowadays there is a lot of emphasis on the need uh, for law enforcement uh, agencies to engage in uh, cooperations. And so, um, I mean, we uh, have here uh, somebody that works in uh, uh, Interpol, so the international organization that uh, facilitates uh, international uh, cooperation, police cooperation. So we would like to uh, hear from uh, uh, Caroline. What do you uh, think about in the, uh, according to your experience? Hello everybody, uh, I would like to first thank uh, the University of Groningen for this invitation. Uh, we've been Interpol has been carrying out a number of uh, EU research projects together with the University of Groningen and it's really always a, a pleasure to uh, pursue that collaboration, thank you. Um, <coughs> the answer to your question whether uh, Interpol uh, uh, processes uh, biometric data is, uh, is of course <coughs> affirmative. Yes, Interpol does process biometric data and I have the challenging task to walk you through that in, in a couple of minutes, the how and the why and the what. Uh, that's it, I'm around all day, so feel free to reach out later if you wish so. Now, the mandate of Interpol is to facilitate uh, international police cooperation amongst uh, 192 member countries. Uh, Interpol is not Europol. Interpol has a, an operational cooperation agreement with Europol uh, at EU level. Uh, Interpol has 192 member countries, and so as a consequence, uh, processing of police data uh, by way of linking the dots uh, is really a cornerstone of uh, Interpol's activities, and uh, the processing of uh, biometric data is certainly part of that. Now, a quick background. Um, as you know, criminality has become uh, predominantly uh, internationally, be it terrorism, trafficking in human beings, uh, environmental crime, international drug cartels, 
so therefore, uh, effective international police cooperation is really a prerequisite to uh, solve uh, those crimes. Uh, and we have on top of that, uh, beside this changing nature of criminality, really an uh, unprecedented level of uh, threat that is posed uh, globally. Now, in all this context of, of globalization of criminality, uh, it is really important uh, not to overlook the role of the UN in this context. Uh, in particular, the adoption of a number of Security Council resolutions, namely in the field of uh, terrorism. And in this regard, the uh, Security Council Re Resolution 2322 uh, of 2016 calls upon the states uh, to share, where appropriate, information about foreign terrorist organizations, including biometric information via bilateral, regional, and global law enforcement challenge, challenges. So in this context, Interpol's uh, biometric databases are explicitly uh, cited uh, in that, uh, in that uh, resolution. Uh, and Interpol's cooperation, as well as the, of, of the one of the member countries, is really called upon. So we have there a situation where the UN imposes, the imposes, calls upon the member countries to exchange biometric data between member states, and that's really an important context to be kept in mind. Uh, you know that the Security Council are not just guidelines, they are binding. Um, the member countries have to uh, follow them up. They are scrutinized and member states can, be, uh, can be, um, uh, get sanctions if they don't, uh, if they don't follow up these, uh, um, uh, these resolutions. Um, <coughs> now, Interpol did not wait till this uh, resolution of 2016 to embark on facilitating exchange of biometric data. Uh, currently, uh, DNA profiles, fingerprints, facial ima images are processed uh, uh, at Interpol via Interpol channels, and we are currently, as Evgeny said, it, uh, 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 carrying out a research project on speaker identification that uh, will soon be closed. The Interpol data, uh, very quickly, in one minute, the Interpol da DNA databases was created in 2002. Uh, just for your information, uh, DNA profiles were used for the first time in the UK in 1987, and the first DNA databases uh, uh, dates from 1995. Today we have over 65 countries uh, that have their national database, DNA database, and over uh, about 120 countries uh, that use uh, DNA in their police investigations without having a national database. So there is a growing trend to use DNA, but we have to bear in mind that it's still a very expensive technology, uh, that it requires a lot of training, uh, that there are ethical concerns with the use of it. Uh, currently, uh, there are uh, over 160,000 DNA profiles, uh, so the profiles, and uh, the barcode, the unique reference number, uh, within, without the names of the persons within the Interpol databases. Uh, the result of the consultation of the database will be a hit-no-hit -hit, uh, database. Uh, and the authorized uh, authorities that consult that database will be redirected to the source country to then uh, uh, exchange more in-depth uh, uh, bilateral uh, consultation and bilateral information. Important vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis data protection is that the accreditation status of the laboratory that produced the profile is a mandatory element uh, to be provided. Um, the fingerprint database was created in 2000. Uh, today it contains over 181,000 fingerprint records and about uh, 11,000 latent fingerprints. Uh, the purpose is again to enable the comparison of a national fingerprint against non-national fingerprints and so to create the opportunity for international matches. So that can we be a person vis-a-vis -vis a scene, a crime scene vis-a-vis -vis another crime scene or a person to a person when there is no previous connection. The templates, uh, there is a certain standardization. The templates are submitted in a NIST format. Uh, there is a manual quality control when fingerprints are submitted. And there is also a quality check afterwards when, in case of a positive hit, there are two um, fingerprints experts at Interpol that will, uh, that will verify the, this uh, automated result. Uh, if they do not agree in between each other, a third one will be appointed, uh, is consulted as well. Thirdly and finally, uh, in 2016, Interpol has set up a facial recognition database as a complement to DNA and fingerprints. Again, the purpose is the same, to, to make comparison of national facial images. Uh, a quality check is done also before recording these facial images. Uh, 
so that's for the, 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 the facial recognition. Uh, who has access? Importantly, Interpol National Central Bureaus. The Interpol National Central Bureaus are the central contact points in each of these 192 countries um, uh, of, 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 of Interpol member countries. So these national uh, country points have access to the databases and also authorized entities. And with authorized entities, we mean um, <coughs> legally authorized entities that fulfill the role of public institution uh, of, uh, in enforcing the criminal law and that have been specifically authorized to, uh, via an agreement uh, to, uh, to, uh, to access and to consult those databases. Um, important point, uh, consultation of data uh, at Interpol and providing inf information to Interpol uh, is based on a, a la carte system, in fact, uh, by definition, uh, by principle, each country uh, can uh, put restrictions uh, on the way how his data or her, his data will be consulted within the databases. In other words, when uh, uh, when information is sent to Interpol, uh, the con it's it's not therefore that this information will circulate in the, uh, around the whole world. It's up to the country to decide to whom with whom they want to play play with whom they want to share uh, information. And I will end by that uh, the conditions. Uh, uh, Interpol has a, has a very detailed uh, uh, set of regulations of 135 provisions. Uh, please uh, bear in mind that these 135 provisions are applicable on top of national legislation because the first start is uh, the basis is legally collected information that is transmitted to, uh, to Interpol. Um, <coughs> These, uh, uh, and so this, uh, uh, the more you get, this is sometimes forgotten, the more you get international, the more you, you need a stringent uh, set of rules because the trust is less, so you need a, a more stricter uh, uh, framework. Um, other conditions are the standard operating procedures and user guides and other particular uh, conditions in the uh, RPD. Uh, the, there are uh, special conditions for the, for the processing of particular, what we call particularly relevant uh, purposes. And the purposes, as I said, are uh, for comparison, for ident identification, and in case of the facial images, uh, uh, the databases is also used for uh, forensic purposes. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Caroline. Uh, it's important to have the point of view of the end users. Coming back to the uh, C project, to the speaker identification project, uh, Evgeny, uh, do l law enforcement agencies store biometric data, uh, like speech data, and of course, they share this data, according to your experience? Yeah, uh, thank you, sir. Uh, as explained by Caroline, but also as you all know, uh, law enforcement agencies have shown so far a great interest in the use of biometric systems and biometric data. There are many biometric systems established around the world, those containing facial images, such as the one in the US, which can easily be accessed by the FBI, which is a great matter of concern, some could say. There are fingerprints, databases, but also databases containing voice, voice data. Allegedly, China is currently developing a, a database with voice data of its citizens. And uh, given the uh, well activities in which uh, Chinese government uh, from time to time participates, it might be also a matter of concern. If one closely examines the new directive that I talked about, he or she might discover uh, Article 35, which specifically makes it possible for member states of the U European Union to transfer personal data, including biometric data, to third countries, but also to international organizations, for example, Interpol. <coughs> of course, certain conditions need to be met in this regard. Uh, this must be the authorities, the competent authorities, which are uh, transmitting or submitting data with specific purposes, the purposes of investigation, detection, or prosecution of criminal offenses, for example. Also, there must be an adequacy decision of the European Commission with regard to the country to which the data is transmitted. But as it is always the case, or quite often the case, there are certain derogations. And uh, in the case of imminent and serious risk and threats posed by certain individuals or events to the national security of a member state of the European Union or a third country, uh, the, the, the requirement of adequacy decisions or uh, adequate safeguards can be abolished. So it is possible for the state still to transfer the data to third countries and international organizations, but only in a very limited number of cases. In the recital, coming back to the Interpol issue, in the recital, the directive specifically uh, indicates the need for improving cooperation between the European Union and Interpol. 
And in this regard, it's necessary not only to effectively and efficiently cooperate uh, among law enforcement agencies, but also to improve uh, the protection of human rights, fundamental rights and freedoms, such as the right to privacy and data protection, which we shouldn't forget about. Let me come back to the SIP research, uh, or the empirical research that we carried out for our project. In one of our reports um, regarding trends and standards in privacy and data protection legislation, but also the status of legislation practices with regard to um, uh, lawful interception practices, monitoring practices of law enforcement agencies that we carried out among 28 countries, 27 EU member states and Israel, I think that we came up with some remarkable uh, results. Uh, a questionnaire was compiled and sent to 28 legal experts from different countries who provided their views on, on the existing practices and legislation existing in their countries. We found out that in practically all the states, laws and procedures exist which tackle the issue of lawful interception monitoring. Quite interestingly, in more than 20 countries, police and security services, intelligence services, are the ones who are actively involved in this process of gathering voice data for interception and, 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 and the context of monitoring of telecommunications. They also use a variety of tools in this regard. In uh, uh, many states, in all the states, in 28 states, it is possible to monitor uh, fixed telephone lines or mobile phones in order to gather your speech data. Quite surprisingly, as we discovered, in uh, almost in 17 states, uh, it was allowed to even deploy intrusion technologies such as malware or Trojan viruses in order to capture your voice. And all these measures are, of course, provided for in the legislation, so they can be lawfully deployed. Um, how is this data stored is also another important question. In the uh, half of all the states in 16 countries, they are stored, these data are stored as audio files. But in eight countries, they are stored as audio files and speech patterns. And speech patterns are the uh, a type of data that we are working uh, with in the C project. These are basically statistical models which are derived from the actual audio recordings of voices uh, that cannot be converted back to the audio files. So it's a privacy uh, enhancing feature which is used in the system. But we all know that law enforcement agencies do not operate in a legal vacuum, in an operational vacuum, and sometimes they need to share their data. In 15 countries it is possible to share data among different databases, among different uh, agencies and entities, and only in nine states uh, it is prohibited. So yeah, I the, the biometric data, as you can see, is often used by law enforcement agencies, but also shared among each other and with third countries or international organizations such as Interpol. Thank you, Evgeny. Uh, very interesting to know all these uh, <laughs> issues. Um, now we would like to go to, to move to the third uh, topic of this panel, the data protection and privacy by design. Uh, we know that the new data protection framework, both the GDPR and the directive, introduced pr provision regarding the privacy and, data uh, privacy and data protection by design. But we also know that there are some uh, limitations. Uh, Caroline. Catherine, pardon. Would you know? <laughs> Can you tell me a little bit more about it? Yes, of course. Um, data protection by design and by default, uh, I think it's, it's, it's one of the provisions that uh, we have uh, heard a lot about. Um, so you find a provision on not privacy by design, but data protection by design by default in both the GDPR and the directive. But uh, this provision is quite limited because it only imposes an obligation uh, on data controllers to implement appropriate technical and organizational measures to manage uh, data, so uh, from the collection to uh, the reuse of data. And these uh, measures, they have to be adopted before uh, the collection of data. They have to be decided. We are very far from the concept of privacy by design that uh, some of you uh, might know. Uh, Anne Kaboukian, uh, who was uh, the commissioner of Ontario, has promoted the idea for 17 years. When she was a commissioner, uh, she's not anymore. She's a professor specialized on privacy uh, by design. And the idea was actually uh, to involve all the actors uh, that are uh, managing data, not only data controllers, huh, uh, but also uh, designers of systems that are used uh, to manage uh, personal data or personal information. Uh, but in, in the directive and the GDPR, these producers, these designers, they are left out. 
They are only encouraged uh, by recital 78 of the GDPR to take into account the right to data protection. So it's, it's, a, it's a very broad, uh, uh, I can't say obligation, but it's, 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 a, it's a very broad uh, uh, incentive. Broad in the sense that uh, uh, taking into account the right to data protection means nothing. <laughs> Um, so the only possibility that data controllers have is to introduce a contractual obligation and uh, is that as data controller you buy a system, you have to make sure that the system are compliant with the GDPR to make sure that yourself as a data controller will be you will be able to, uh, to comply with your obligation. Uh, I have to say that um, during uh, the Ingress pro project, uh, we worked on a privacy by design methodology that was based on the Article 25 of the GDPR. Uh, we only worked on the verification purposes huh, in this uh, project. Uh, and when we developed um, s uh, several uh, fingerprint uh, prototypes, the designers were also data controllers. So they were subject uh, to our manu manual of procedures, and for example, uh, they had to store biometric data under a pseudonymous uh, form, which means that uh, they did not uh, keep the identity of the individuals. Uh, they were not exchanging uh, the biometric data between them. They, um, they store them on a key drive and they were actually, they had a hard disk uh, and a key drive to, to exchange the data. So uh, they had set up a very high uh, level of um, security and uh, protection, uh, and, uh, to, 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 to and they only uh, processed data of volunteers, but it was in the context of a research project. Uh, having said that, you have to be aware that this obligation is quite limited in the end. It was already existing to ensure the security of the data. It has been brought up to the management of, of data, but it's limited uh, in the sense that if you don't have cooperation uh, from the designer and the producer, it's difficult to ensure appropriate technical measures. Thank you, Catherine. <laughs> I think it's really important to stress these uh, differences and uh, uh, the fact that the obligations, at least uh, uh, in the, the provision of the new uh, framework uh, are uh, addressed to the data controllers and so the designers uh, uh, are not at least directly uh, uh, involved. So going to the designers, uh, so the technical uh, side, uh, Kiran, uh, are uh, the designers actually currently uh, taking into account these privacy rules? Uh, what do you can uh, say about it? Uh, so uh, going back to the point uh, Kathleen mentioned, in Ingress project we had this uh, very large scale fingerprint databases and of course we had to maintain the, uh, the privacy of the, um, uh, of the data subjects. Right? So the first step was, of course, to have these pseudonymous identities, which are completely unlinked to each other, um, and then process the data as it is uh, in the case where privacy is preserved. So therefore, I have, uh, instead of talking about the um, privacy by design, I'm talking more about privacy, uh, preserving the privacy. Uh, and again, for the simplicity of uh, the understanding, I'm just using the pictures of uh, face, and it could be any other pictures that you typically use. So when you typically get this uh, biometric data, as you see in the first part of the uh, picture. You process them, you extract the features, and then what, what happens is that most of the databases, or what happened traditionally is that most of the databases had the face images as it is in, the, uh, in, the, in, in any of the uh, government databases, right? So now, to preserve the privacy, what we, from the technical standpoint, do is uh, to introduce what is called as uh, template protection schemes. So you would not be able to identify the subject as it is. Uh, that's uh, marked in the red uh, zone up there. Uh, but instead, you would be saving the templates uh, in a different format that is completely uh, not linkable. So when we talk about uh, these databases, uh, as uh, Interpol's <coughs> opinion was also heard before, we have these databases that are from different countries and for different services. A criminal database should not be linked to a civil database. So the only way to do this is uh, is by a concept of unlinkability, which means that even though I give you two databases, you should not be able to link them or link the subjects if the subject is in both the databases. Now, uh, based on the use cases, of course, you have different measures for unlinkability that you use. Uh, what we also implement 
in preserving privacy is uh, it's a concept of irreversibility meaning which if I give you the image uh, that is stored in the database you should not be able to reconstruct the facial image so this gives uh, an another opportunity for users not to misuse your databases right misuse your personal data and the third uh, important concept in terms of uh, preserving privacy is also renewability so let's say uh, the cases of uh, database compromises such as um, in Brazil the fingerprint database was compromised uh, or for instance uh, some database instances that happen in the Eastern uh, Asian countries that were compromised in such cases you get the whole set of uh, biometric data now the problem with biometric data is again that we do not have uh, control as in the case of password we can always generate new password but we cannot generate new biometric data the only way to ensure that the data is not uh, uh, is not used or misused for a different reason we need to make sure that the templates are continuously renewed meaning which the way you renew the passwords you should be able to renew the the templates based on the pure biometric data that you have uh, so the the summarizing the the three key concepts that we uh, take into consideration when we're talking about uh, preserving privacy is uh, unlinkability not to link criminal databases against civil databases irreversibility Civil databases compromised, you should not be able to reconstruct the facial images back or fingerprint images back. And then, of course, the uh, renewability. So if the database is compromised, then you should be able to revoke the whole set of templates using a new uh, new uh, methodology. Um, so that, that being said, I would uh, pass on the uh, mic to the others. Thank you, Kiran, for uh, all these technical uh, details. And now we conclude with uh, the hand users' uh, perspective again. Uh, with uh, the Interpol, uh, are there any Interpol rules and procedures regarding uh, privacy by design, uh, data protection by design, and uh, particularly on the biometric data? Mm. Uh, thank you, Shara. Uh, I'm a bit smiling because uh, Interpol exists since 100 years. Their first data processing rules date from 1982, one year after the adoption of the uh, Convention 108 of the Council of Europe. Uh, so when, when in an international organization or in an organization data processing is really the core, the core of the business, uh, of course, you, by essence, you do privacy by design because you have a core set of rules and, and any project that you would set up would have to be from the beginning on uh, in, in, in harmony, in, in compliance with the rules. Uh, so, uh, in fact, I, I must admit that in the rules themselves, in the latest update of Interpol rules, because they are very often updated, they are very often updated uh, approximately every three years. Uh, the notion as such of privacy by design is not, is not uh, incorporated, is not included, uh, but the through if you read the rules, and, and uh, a colleague of mine is here, and we, we have copies of the rules, and they are on, uh, available on, on the public websites, uh, on the public website. Uh, if you go through the rules, you will see that continuously, uh, in fact, uh, uh, privacy by design is, is really embedded in, in, in the rules. Uh, and how is that? Um, a couple of examples. Um, data quality. Um, there are ex ante checks that are done before the information is recorded. Uh, some checks are automated, uh, incom such as incomplete forms uh, are automatically rejected. Uh, other ex ante checks are manual, depending on the nature of the request. Uh, for instance, a request for a red notice, which is an international uh, uh, Request, which is, which is a request uh, to, to arrest a person, which is very privacy in intrusive. Uh, there will be, of course, a manual uh, and an intellectual uh, verification that is done by a task force uh, of 40 persons that work every every day on those uh, the verification of those requests. So it depends on the nature of the request that is done, whether the, the ex ante check will be manual, automated, or both of them. Uh, another example is for the fingerprints uh, database. Uh, if there is a positive hit in the fingerprint database, uh, two fingerprint experts will verify these automated results. And as I said, if they don't agree, uh, a third one will be consulted as well. Another element of, uh, of, of putting in place privacy by design is uh, the obligation to keep logs, uh, to allow audits. We cannot, at Interpol, we just cannot uh, uh, implement new projects or have databases uh, of sharing of information without having those logs that, of course, can only be used for uh, compliance, uh, verific compli compliance <laughs> purposes. Uh, other example of, uh, besides all the security uh, issues uh, uh, regarding privacy by design, examples of transparency that is embedded. Uh, at any time, a source country uh, can check who has consulted uh, his data. 
uh, and how is that technically done? Well, whenever country A is consulting the database and there is, uh, there is a hit, uh, they will automatically, they will an alert going to the source country so that he can know uh, who has been uh, consulting his, uh, his information and can, ch can check and can further work, work on that and, and, and collaborate. Uh, transparency in procedures. Uh, whenever a project proposal, uh, because privacy by design is not only technical, it's also organizational measures. Um, every time that a new project proposal is, uh, uh, is, uh, is submitted at Interpol, uh, at each stage, uh, the external oversight body uh, must give its uh, validation, must be consulted, uh, so that uh, projects can, um, can, be, uh, can be run from the very beginning uh, within, uh, within compliance of, uh, of Interpol rules. Um, Another example is, uh, of organization measures is the inclusion of the obligation of uh, data protection by design in procurements for new softwares that was already indicated. These are small things, but that are very important, uh, that whenever Interpol is, 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 is buying new software, that that will be an, uh, an additional criteria uh, for, uh, within the, pr the procurement uh, procedure. Um, I could give many other examples, uh, specifically to biometric data. Uh, the GDPR and directive uh, provide as examples the pseudonymization and data minimization, as you said. Uh, this is, of course, particularly relevant for biometric data that are sensitive. So at Interpol, we really try as much as possible to desensitize uh, these data. Um, DNA uh, is stored as a DNA profile, so that is really the string of all these numbers without, of course, the name of the person. So if somebody falls on this string, they can do literally nothing with this, with this, with this <coughs> data. So it's a sort of pseudonymization. Um, the strings of numbers cannot be used for other purposes. Data quality is very important for fingerprints. Um, uh, as I said, these manual checks uh, also uh, of utmost importance, data quality for the facial images uh, database. Uh, there has been a lot of discussion when we put up uh, this uh, database, uh, what would be the threshold to accept how many pixels uh, to accept for the um, uh, for this uh, uh, for this um, uh, the acceptance for these images? Um, today it's so many pixels. Maybe tomorrow it will be the obligation will be uh, to have uh, three-dimensional scans, even not only of your face but really internally of your cheeks and everything, to make sure that your face recognition is okay. So this is really uh, this is really very uh, relevant to be uh, to be uh, proactive to think in the future. Uh, and this brings me to a final conclusion that uh, uh, we, uh, Interpol as international organization, we cannot work in silos. It's since years that we collaborate with acad academics, with private sector, with, and also reach out to the civil society <laughs> because whatever new technology that is invented, if it's not accepted by civil society, you can forget about it. Uh, you won't be able to use it. Uh, so that, that, that would be, um, let, let's not think that everything is okay. Uh, we have really to think in the future and, and, um, and further develop. Thank you very much, Caroline. Um, now the floor is all yours, so we have time for questions or comments or reflections, um, if anybody wants to share. And, but I guess, I guess um, yeah. Yes. Can you maybe, um, could you maybe use the, the microphone in front? Um, if that's okay, yeah. But it's, uh, it's also it's for the recording. Yeah. So, so my question would be, and, and thinking back on the amendment of the Schengen Protocol, yeah. um, now Interpol's is working. Uh, what, what? Is it working? No, I, I, I understand you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, now Interpol's databases are. Uh, 
uh, can I ask the panelists to repeat the questions for people in the back? Yeah. So maybe they couldn't hear very well. Sorry, the, the first half at least was uh, was was uh, uh, directed to me. Uh, like uh, now with this new sh uh, border Schengen border system, uh, Interpol is mentioned. How will that be articulated, and which uh, kind of databases would then, which relevant because it's the relevant databases, which one would that be? Now, thank you very much for the question because, of course, not all databases, and certainly not the DNA database, would be uh, immediately linked to a, a Schengen border system. Um, the most, um, the most. Uh, Obvious uh, database that would be linked will, will be the uh, uh, will be the stolen uh, passport and official documents. Uh, this is um, this is a data a, a global international uh, database uh, containing um, uh, stolen passports. You have all sorts of passports. You have blank passports. You have also uh, uh, stolen passports, forged pa passports. Uh, there is. There are not the names of the persons. It's a passport number, but never, nevertheless, it's personal data. And this is really the first one on which uh, uh, they would be working to link it together. Um, regarding to go further, um, I read through the papers and in project that they, they, they the biometric is very much in the lift for the moment. Uh, why? Because because it provides very much accru accuracy. Um, on the same time, at the same time, um, w w we know that privacy by design uh, is not only security, that you have all these other elements that should be Im embedded, like transparency and, 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 and uh, the possibility of audit and, and quality and whatever. Uh, I think with this uplift of, of the biometric data, the security will be, the security aspect will be reinforced because you, you, you just cannot afford that that would be, and w that, w that would be hacked, uh, that there would be uh, an, an unlawful access to these databases. But at the first, in the first step, it would just only be uh, this, um, this uh, stolen passport uh, documents, which, is, which, which makes sense, which makes sense in a way. Uh, on the other hand, uh, for biometric, uh, especially at the border control, um, two things. One that has nothing to do with, 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 with police, in fact, but it's just the fact that uh, when we think of people, let us think, for instance, about the flow of immigration uh, from countries that, they, that politically are, 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 are in difficulties for the moment. Um, we should not forget that biometric data uh, allows them to have a new identity. Those people have lost everything. They have no passport anymore, nothing to identify themselves. So in that way, biometric data are uh, extremely imp important. Um, the, the, the input of, of and, and I'm very careful about that, um, the, the, the input of, uh, of the Interpol database w would, to my sense, be a legitimate input to, yeah, to verify that the good people are, are let in and that they are uh, uh, verification done uh, at, the, at, the, at the border. Yeah. I think that will be a second stage, the, 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 the fingerprint database. Yeah, uh, the second question was on linking the databases and how this uh, is technically carried out. So uh, technical, from a technical standpoint, the linking and the unlinkability of the databases is very much essential, and we do that. Uh, I can talk in terms of the private companies that uh, do this. For example, Facebook or Google, when they collect this data, they are not allowed to link the databases to the uh, central databases, right? So this is the direct use requirement. Now what happens typically is a case of, let's take a case of Boston bombing uh, when it happened in the marathon. And they had one suspect databases, and that literally led to all the databases that they had of all suspects. Now, in such cases, it's the uh, the authorities that make a call on what they use the databases for. But as far as the uh, technicality is concerned, both these databases are uh, separately uh, preserved, and they're not linked to each other. But then the matching can be done against uh, different kind of uh, databases. And this is, again, uh, this brings to the concept of uh, searching over the encrypted domain or searching over the encrypted templates that you don't know what the template is all about and you can do it. Um, but maybe uh, Caroline is, uh, is a better person to tell, uh, talk about how this is actually done uh, in, in, the, in the real life scenarios. No, uh, I know that in th th there has been a sort of ev evolution. The DNA database for the moment is what we call a standalone database. Uh, and we know uh, within EU circles as well, there is a lot, uh, we speak a lot about interoperability, uh, but with also all this, the, 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 the concern about the multi-purposes, uh, which is, and, and yeah, the, 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 the purpose creep, of the, 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 that, that the purpose will really extend. Um, 
Yeah, as, as working in, in a law enforcement, I, of course, I, I see daily the benefits of, of, of linking the dots. And that, that's for the law enforcement, that, that's about it, to, to find really, we, we have success stories that we would never have thought about, about fingerprints from Australia that suddenly pops up in a, in a check case and stuff, uh, stuff like that, uh, and from different uh, databases. Um, yeah, here we, we, I would say oversight, oversight, oversight. <laughs> Uh, having having controls, having proper oversight mechanism, and then you can, the minute you have good oversight mechanism, you can go very far. Mm. Maybe I can also say a few words about the legal aspects of it, because as you can imagine, if uh, data is processed for one purpose and reused for another purpose, it can lead to function creep, as you mm. uh, correctly pointed out. So it wasn't specifically designed, the system, to process data on that purpose, but it's done anyway. If we look at the uh, framework of criminal justice, uh, Article 4 of the directive specifically states that data which has been processed for a purpose such as investigation of crimes, for example, can be reused for another purpose under Article 1, Paragraph 1, so maybe prosecution, etc., if uh, some conditions are met. So the controller must be specifically authorized by national law or by the EU law to do so, or there must be authorization under European Union law or national law to do so, and it must be ne necessary and proportional. So we can reuse the data for another purpose if it is lawful, necessary, and proportional. So you cannot just link one database to another without meeting all those requirements. Mm -hmm. I think it's also a very essential uh, notion to take into account. So lawfulness, necessity, proportionality. Perhaps you want to use this microphone. Thank you. Yes, um, talking about uh, uh, interoperability, also because I attended yesterday a very interesting panel uh, concerning the new package, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. My uh, curiosity is: uh, Does Interpol have access to databases like VSIS, uh, uh, Eurodac, and what about the new um, entry access system? Um, because all these databases with the new package are meant to be, I mean, uh, <laughs> they should be um, uh, connected all together. Um, they have biometric data, obviously, different one. So I wanted to know mm -hmm. uh, yes. the role of it. Yeah. Um, thank you. Uh, indeed, the, the Interpol has been involved, of course, in this, uh, in this, uh, all the elaboration of this, uh, of uh, in the preliminary discussions of all this new program. Um, I'm not the perfect expert ab about that. There are many persons that have followed up all these uh, working groups. Uh, that said, um, there I just passed through my desk a, a couple of days ago, but there is a project going on uh, to have indeed uh, Interpol, uh, uh, Interpol databases linked in that, uh, in, that, in that program as well. Um, and so th th it, this is, this is uh, well, this is project, pro uh, this is a project for the moment, but uh, of course the idea is uh, of interoperability, to, to have it as large as possible. Um, the advantage of, of Interpol is that uh, uh, the, the, the databases are global, uh, and uh, first and foremost, that Interpol has a, a, a regulation, a data protection regulation, of, as I said, of 136 provisions. I really uh, invite you to, to read those, <laughs> if you want to read those 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 uh, those rules, because they are very detailed. Uh, it's an expertise of since 1982, and this is just to make it legally interoperable, interoperable. Uh, not only within the EU, but outside the e EU as well. Because this brings me to the question, uh, what about the directive and, and Interpol, the new directive and Interpol, how, how does that fit together? Because it's about international transfers. Uh, there, uh, as Evgeny said already, you, you, you have several options. The first one is adequacy decision, but it's policy-wise, and, and, and it's just not feasible to ask an adequacy decision that an international organization with 192 countries would ask for a, an, an adequacy decision. And the second condition, uh, the alternative second condition is uh, provide effective safeguards. Now that said, uh, since uh, the, the, the framework decision of 2008 uh, already imposed member countries 
the framework decision of 2008 applicable to the police sector already imposed to the member states uh, to ensure that there was an adequate data protection regime whenever that member country, member state would uh, transfer information to a third country or an international organization. So in say, the directive in principle has not changed very much. Uh, it again doesn't state adequate data protection regime but says effective safeguards. And how do you, how can you provide effective safeguards uh, by a binding legal instrument, uh, and there we have these famous rules. Uh, they, they, the countries uh, can be uh, really sanctioned if they don't follow up the rules. You, you should know that uh, collaborating via Interpol is not an obligation, but is very much encouraged. But the minute that a country has decided, uh, for instance, to search a, somebody via Interpol, Interpol channels, then the rules are applicable. Because, but you should know as well that. Uh, the main work of Interpol is really the first step check identification. As I said, DNA, fingerprints, etc. There is a hit, and then it goes back to the country, and there the bilateral uh, deep uh, analysis go, go, go more bilaterally. Uh, so this is how we want to, and, and this is the, the, the opportunity for Interpol and the condition. Interpol wouldn't exist anymore if they hadn't strong data protection rules who will be swept of the, of the, of the map since long. Um, so this is why uh, our rules are really updated every three years. Um, we have updated the rules in 2011, 2014, and 2016. Uh, as a matter of another safeguards, for instance, I give you a few examples, is the fact that in each National Central Bureau in the 192 member countries, uh, there is mandatorily a data protection officer that is appointed. So we see the role of Interpol really to leverage the standard of data protection in globally. Uh, the fact only that you have there in these 190 member countries where perhaps some data, uh, some, some, some countries have no, no proper uh, data protection uh, uh, legislation, uh, that there at least, if it goes via Interpol channels, there is a, s a sort of leverage uh, because there is a data protection who is trained, who, know, who, who, who knows, uh, who, who can uh, at least uh, uh, effectuate a kind of control. I must say, I, I do some trainings in, in the in all sorts of countries, in including Tonga. I was, I was in, in Dakar in, in summertime, and I must say, when I get then after a training from a data protection officer, a mail by saying, Caroline, you have mentioned uh, these ISO standards on privacy impact <laughs> assessment. Uh, can you give me a copy or whatever? Then this person made my day, frankly. Then I'm, I'm, I'm happy. <laughs> but that's the purpose, that's the condition to work in this interoperable uh, uh, new mechanism, that the condition is to have really a strong uh, framework. Thank you. Um, I have one uh, technical and one ethical question. So, as you noticed, uh, biometrics is on the rise because it's far more superior than other identifiers. But uh, uh, so, my question is: and all EU IT systems are dependent on the biometrics as a means of verification, identification. But what about possibilities for mistakes? So, how? often is that possible to have a false positive or, or false negative match and uh, it is far more difficult for uh, citizens to rebut this. And the second question is, um, you, Caroline, uh, said that uh, uh, biometrics gives people coming from uh, problematic countries for a new identity. I think it's actually diff completely different. It doesn't give them opportunity for new identity because they only have one you know, like no. biometrics data, right? I mean, it, what about people who don't want that identity anymore? This is just mm. an ethical question. Maybe not for you, yeah. for anybody. Yeah. No, no for, for me as well. <laughs> it's not because we are law enforcement that we are not ethical. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, 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 I know what you mean. I, I, j I just have a point concerning biometric data. We always say that uh, when you you, uh, you lose your biometric data, y it, it's lost. Actually, biometric data is a representation of your biometric characteristics. So you don't use your face. You don't lose uh, your fingertip. It's just a representation that you mm -hmm. lose. So it's always possible to have a different one. Uh, I think on, t on the... You, you pointed a very good uh, question concerning... Uh, the, the rate of, uh, of, of the, the likelihood of, uh, of uh, mistakes. 
and uh, it comes to uh, as well the definition of what is unique um, from a data protection uh, perspective so the term which is used is unique identification but if you discuss with biometric expert they will tell you that they don't they don't use the term uniqueness because you cannot establish whether uh, two individuals have uh, unique uh, have the same uh, uh, a fingerprint or if they have unique fingerprints let me explain they are looking for similarities so how similar two fingerprints are how similar two faces are they are not looking for 100 percent match because it's not possible but if you want more precision on that i think uh, kiran can give you uh, some numbers on uh, on, on the sure. like uh, yes so uh, so as we said uh, as uh, katrin already mentioned uh, in biometrics, when we talk about uniqueness or uh, the new identity, we always talk about um, how similar they are or how dissimilar they are. And of course, this decision is primary decision that you get. And then you reinforce, uh, such as in the case of Interpol, they have uh, two experts looking at them and then seeing, manually verifying it if it's actually a match or not, just to make sure that there is no false uh, accept. Um, then the second point is that when it comes to the uh, uniqueness, uh, unique ID, when the subject is coming from a country which is problematic and comes to a new country, let's say a European country, then he gets a new um, identity. It means that the identity is linked to his uh, biometrics, not essentially to create a new identity, but to secure his data in a new format, right? Because this country has a, has a different uh, way of securing this data. So the next time there is a criminal activity going on and for some reason, if this person is involved, uh, now, first level is that this country, uh, the, the hit is going to the problematic country where the subject originates from. And then based on the cooperation, as uh, Carolina mentioned, bef between the uh, countries, then goes the second level. But there is no way that uh, the for any other reasons, uh, all the database, all the, uh, the verification or identification done in the new country of the subject is linked to the other country. So this is... Uh, the uniqueness that we are talking about in biometrics and it, so two aspects is one is comparison at the uh, comparison level to match and to reinforce the decisions based on probabilities uh, theories of uh, mathematics statistics second thing is in terms of the establishing new identity and unique uh, id if I just may add a very uh, short point uh, that, uh, and this brings me back to purpose, um, in many legislation or in a number of legislations, for instance, the use of uh, facial recognition and, uh, and speaker recognition uh, can never be used as sole evidence. Uh, you need to have several elements. So this is, when you add up all these elements, this can better lead to a better quality of a charge or a décharge, because don't forget it's also for not being uh, pursued. So this is an, uh, an important element to, to keep in mind as well. And then just, just for, for, for the anecdote, when we were, I didn't conduct the, the SIP project till the end because I became data protection officer, but I remember very well uh, we, we hired a, a specialist in speaker identification and I explained him uh, the rules on uh, automated processing and auto automated decisions. And he said, what is this all about? Um, you are asking me, my machine is, uh, is, 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 uh, is, is calculating something very, very, in a very sophisticated way, and now you're going to, to ask me to verify it manually, whether one plus, plus <laughs> one is, well, no, it's not about that. And they admitted to the speaker recognition that they sometimes relied more on the machine than, than on the human. And then we end up on the ethical, <laughs> on the ethical uh, uh, also uh, aspects uh, in how far can you, uh, can you really uh, uh, trust the machine? But this is where we end. then we end up in artificial in intelligence, etc. So we're fully in the ethical um, edition. Maybe I can also say a few words about the uh, question that you posed, which is a very good one. Mm. Of course, no system is 100% reliable. And if we talk about biometric system, it is also the case. And that's why with regard to the SIP system, for example, we have clearly stated together with Interpol yeah. that this is a probabilistic system. It's not a deterministic system. Mm. It is impossible to find a 100% match to say with 100% certainty that this person is the one who was speaking in the, in the voice uh, data, in the voice recording. So the, uh, the, the data that we gather from using this system cannot be used before courts as evidence. Mm -hmm. It is used by law enforcement agencies to support them in their efforts to identify criminals and terrorists, for example. Yes. 
thank you very much for your answers. Uh, it clarifies a lot, but th this is why I asked this about uh, uh, mistakes because of new proposal for automated borders. So this is not like classical law enforcement thing where you have like investigators checking. It's like automated person comes with on some, put his fingers and there is a false positive, false negative. I mean, there is a match or no match. So this is, you don't have all the guarantees that you talked about. That This is why I asked about this. Mm -hmm possibilities for mistakes. Uh, you refer to uh, the principle of necessity and proportionality as a way to limit the reuse of biometrics. And I was wondering, do you have any example where uh, in the context of law enforcement you would have a negative proportionality assessment that would prevent the use of biometrics or the reuse of biometric data? Yeah. I was talking indeed about the framework of criminal justice and I would imagine that if it's not, well, the directive poses in some provisions the strictly necessity uh, principle. So it must be strictly necessary, for example, to use sensitive personal data. Biometric data cannot be easily processed, not when it's necessary, it must be strictly necessary. And I think that you can find not a definition, but a reference to the strictly necessary principle in the Digital Rights Ireland uh, case from 2014, in which the, uh, the data retention uh, directive was declared to be invalid. Uh, so it must be strictly necessary. Uh, when we are dealing with the criminal justice uh, sphere or field, it must be one of the conditions that I mentioned, it must be strictly necessary and proportional in order to reuse personal data, but it must be, the conditions for that must be laid down in the national laws, in the national procedures. Mm -hmm. So when it's not necessary, for example, strictly necessary, it's when a criminal when, when, a, when a competent authority would like to prosecute somebody and it's not necessary to conduct further investigations because it has been determined, for example, that with a high percentage of uh, certainty that this individual is not a potential suspect anymore. You cannot reuse this data because it's not necessary anymore. That's what I was thinking about, um, the necessity principle. The proportionality is how you determine the means that you are using and what will be in the end result. So what, is it proportional to go that far to use the data collected for the principle of in for, for the purpose of investigation for the prosecution of a criminal offense. That's what I would say about the ne uh, necessity and proportionality. <coughs> but again, it is a directive and of course member states need to decide themselves how they implement the st standards laid down in the directive. They can go higher, uh, Article 3 if I'm uh, correct, they can go higher with the standards with regard to the protection of rights and freedoms of human, uh, of natural persons, human beings. But, uh, well, I, I'm, I'm afraid I do not have a concrete example because the directive is still not transposed and we have to analyze the national legislation in order to see how it will be implemented and enforced in the future. I, I'm, I would say that would be my answer to you. mentioned this in, in terms of uh, proportionality necessity for prosecuting, but what about preventing? What about uh, threat assessment, risk assessment? Um, when do we um, assess that uh, um, biometric, the biometric use of data is for law enforcement purposes for is uh, necessary and proportionally? We, uh, do we have a threshold in that in that sense or? That, that would be I my think even the working party uh, 29 cannot uh, give you clear answers with regard to that. What they state is, for example, that uh, competent authorities need to establish the DPO, of course, because it's very important to assess possible risks which are posed by the processing of personal data. And when there is a high risk to the rights and freedoms of individuals, I think that in this regard you can state that not only uh, data protection impact assessments are necessary, that they need to be carried out, but also other organizational and uh, technical measures are to be taken. So uh, with regard to the risks, I would say that if there is a high and serious risk that a certain individual will, for example, pose a threat to the national security of a state, I think that the data, um, as I said, can be transferred, for example, to a third country for further investigation, but also it would be possible to repurpose its use and to use it uh, further, mm -hmm. if indeed there are national laws and national procedures on that, if they allow that. Just to, very quickly, just to finish maybe. 
Sorry. Just, just on, on, to build very quickly to, to chip in that. Uh, first of all, let us not mix up law enforcement and 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 and, and security services and and and, and threats and national threat and voila. These are two separate uh, two separate uh, uh, professions, two separate uh, sets of rules. But what you say is true. Um, law enforcement also work on the prevention, that's for sure, but prevention in, in, in specific investigations. And we have, of course, thought a lot about that. How are, are we going to do, especially in the field of uh, cyber criminality, where the, where the data are not structured anymore because it's, you have much more control on, on, on structured data than on unstructured data. Uh, and then you have to be inventive. And we have a lot of, of, of uh, discussion with that with Europol, for instance. Uh, and one is just one example, but there you can imagine that uh, instead of uh, data that, that you may need, but you don't know it at the time that you, you get it. The, you, you, you do it on a, what, what's called an, a, a kind of, of, of separate pool, a separate de on quarantaine, what we would call, and, and very strict deadlines. Do you need, what do you need? If you don't need, pff, away with it. But you cannot otherwise. You have to be realistic. They have to work. So there are some gray zones within when we have to be, to be inventive and, and, and not just swap everything and put it on a database, no, wait, do a quarantaine, let this quarantaine uh, space not rotten, uh, may, may make very, very strict uh, rules to, to analyze that, and then, you know, if that, that's the future, but it's, it's a very, very re uh, relevant question, but, but of course we, we shouldn't mix up uh, 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 threats, national threats in general, which is, which is really the, the security services and, and the intelligence services and, and, and law enforcement. Uh, we are closing up on our session today, so if there aren't any urgent questions or remarks or comments, I would like to thank you for being here, thank you for our speakers, and uh, thank you for the to the University of Groningen to be organizing this session. Have a nice conference.